continuing on with chapter 29, going into patient assessment. So scene size up. Um, if the area is a crime scene, try not to disturb it as much as possible. Um, I have the uh, Minnehaha County Coroner, as well as one of the lead detectives for uh, Crimes Against Persons Division come in and speak with my paramedic students about um, how to preserve crime scenes and crime scene awareness. And the biggest things that they constantly say is patient uh, care takes priority. So if you have to move something, if you have to um, move the patient, et cetera, then take care of your patient adequately. But thoroughly document what you moved, how the patient was found, any other clues that you've seen at the scene um, so that they have the whole picture of what happened from the time the uh, injury occurred until they were given the information. You want to try and fill in those spaces for them and make sure that you request the assistance of law enforcement. Most of the time, again, dispatch will say, hey, this doesn't sound right, and they'll send PD first. Most of the time, any gunshot wounds, stabbings, um, violent assaults end up having law enforcement respond first and then have us come into the scene afterwards. Um, so we're going to um, know that chest injuries are very common in motor vehicle crashes, um, falls, industrial accidents, and assaults. So we want to consider that C-spine stabilization. Um, if necessary, early on, you may want to call um, utility departments if it involves utility lines, fire department, and then ALS as well. Your general impression, um, you can immediately assess for life-threatening hemorrhage, their level of consciousness, and then perform a rapid physical kind of looking to see if something is out of place. We're going to look for ABCs for this patient um, that may have a chest injury. Make sure that you have an airway. Um, consider C-spine early if that's appropriate. Um, you want to pay particular attention to um, jugular venous distension. Do they have what looks like um, massive cords in the sides of their neck. I think I went around on one of the lab days and showed everybody what JVD actually looks like. This is not a, I think it's, no, it's definitely there if it's there. That's um, signs of pressure in the heart, remember, and blood is backing up into the head. Inspect for DCAP BTLS, look for equal adequate chest rise. Uh, you may want to listen early on for this patient. Um, you may notice some what's called paradoxical motion. So that that's the chest not rising in one um, as unison, where the chest normally on an inhale ends up rising up. This will actually, a section will pull down. It's called a flail chest. If you have enough rib fragments in the same area, then you've lost the stability of that portion of the wall. And so it will end up going opposite of how the rest of the chest uh, is moving. If there's any penetrating injuries to the neck, chest, or upper abdomen, you may need to throw on um, some occlusive dressings to keep air from being able to suck into the thoracic cavity through that hole. You're going to support ventilation, make sure that that's effective and watch for decreasing O2 sat, increased uh, shortness of breath, increased agitation, or um, decreasing level of consciousness because that might be a sign of attention pneumothorax. Circulation, we wanna check for our pulse rate, rhythm, quality, skin, color, temperature, texture, because okay, early signs of shock. We go over that constantly, but I have to keep bringing you back to that because once you get on scene and start seeing some of these massive injuries, you're going to forget to look at the skin color. It just happens. You get caught up in the moment. But as EMTs, it's so important for you guys to recognize that early to determine if you need to get ALS running or if you can quickly get them to the hospital. Then your transport decision, any problem with ABC, they're a rapid transport, but make sure you're paying attention to those more subtle clues. So the appearance of the skin, um, the level of consciousness, and if the patient has an impending sense of doom. 
we often hear, you know, am I going to die? I don't want to die from a patient. Not as concerning, but if the patient looks at you and says, I am going to die, it's not a question, it's a statement. Trust that. Don't ever say, no, you're not. We're going to, if they say that, say, I'm going to do everything to make sure that doesn't happen, but you should know things are not good. Here's a table talking about deadly chest injuries, the things that tend to uh, kill patients or give them long-term uh, problems. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'll let you go ahead and look it up in your book, Table 29.1. For history taking, we're going to further investigate the MOI, identify different signs, symptoms, pertinent negatives, verify where the pain is actually located versus where you're touching. Um, there can be a lot of referred pain, not as much as the uh, abdomen, but there can be a fair amount of referred pain. Uh, make sure that you have equal expansion of the chest um, because that can confirm nerve conduction in different areas of the body. We're gonna look at the sample history, um, complete just the basic evaluation if time is possible. Uh, you want to focus some more on the MOI, so the speed of the vehicle, the height of the fall, were there any safety equipment being used, types of weapons that were used, number of penetrating wounds, and honestly, from um, witnesses, you're often not going to get a correct number uh, of shots or stab wounds. Uh, the patient themselves may have no idea how many times they were shot or stabbed. Uh, so that's kind of unreliable. You need to make sure that you do a good physical examination so that you can actually see the extent and the amount of injury that the patient has sustained. For an isolated injury, limited MOI, you're really just going to want to look at that area, explore their complaints a little bit more. If they are having a significant MOI, despite their complaints, we're still going to do a good head to toe because oftentimes your patient is going to have multiple systems that are going to be affected with a significant MOI. For your vital signs, we want to assess pulse, respirations, blood pressure, skin, color temp text, and pupils early on and make sure that you reassess them every five minutes. Um, a good range is every three to five minutes because of the vasculature that can be um, affected. Your lungs obviously are very vital for survival. You want to make sure that you catch trending very, 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 very quickly. A rapid pulse or respiratory rate may indicate that um, the chest injury is causing a decrease in uh, available oxygen. So the patient might be hypoxic or could be um, hypovolemic. Increased work of breathing can be identified with accessory muscles being used. Um, towards the more critical point of a chest injury, pulse and respiratory rates may actually end up decreasing. And so if you see that, that's not a great sign at all. Make sure that you repeat your primary Reassess the chief complaint, make sure nothing else has cropped up. You want to reevaluate, especially your ABCs, make sure that you're checking for perfusion, make sure that you're checking to see if any bleeding is present. You want to make sure that you can identify uh, trends in your vital signs, maintain an open airway. You may need to uh, continue with spinal immobilization for patients who have blunt trauma that you actually suspect a spinal injury with. Um, be prepared to suction the patient, be prepared to place or continue to check occlusive dresses, occlusive dressings as needed. Um, just because you've put that occlusive dressing on there doesn't mean you necessarily treated the problem. Patients can still have a tension pneumothorax, and we'll go into that here in a minute. The easiest treatment, if you have an open chest wound for a patient that has signs of attention pneumothorax and have an occlusive dressing is to lift the dressing and see if you can release the pressure and then replace the dressing back on. You want to make sure that you aggressively treat shock and make sure that you roll out additional resources if you need them very early. 
and we're not delaying transport for any non-life-saving treatments, do those en route. Specific conditions. Pneumothorax, we commonly call this a collapsed lung, but this occurs because of accumulation of the air in that pleural space where there should not be air. The air should be contained within the lung, not within that space. Um, the blood that actually gets into a lung that's collapsed is not going to be able to pass across that blood barrier, that membrane, and so it's not gonna be actually oxygenated because you're not getting enough air into the lung. Um, you may um, hear diminished breath sounds, and that's if the lung has collapsed past that 30 to 40%. If you have a tension pneumothorax, typically you're going to have completely absent breath sounds on that side. Um, if it's an open chest wound, we often call these sucking chest wounds because it does make a gurgling suction, suckling type sound um, as the rushing air comes in or out of that hole. So here's kind of what we're looking at. You've got the two different pleura, the parietal and the visceral, and in between that you have a potential space that has just a little bit of fluid in it. Well, if you have some sort of defect either in the lung itself or the chest wall or both, you can end up collecting air within that pleural space and making a legitimate space, which ends up putting a lot of pressure on the lung because the air gets in, but it can't adequately get out. For your open chest wounds, we often call these an open pneumothorax or a sucking chest wound, like I was saying. You rapidly need to seal that with an occlusive dressing to try and prevent air from coming in externally into that space. Oftentimes, if you have an external defect, your lung's probably going to be affected as well. We can't stop that um, in the field, but you can at least allow for um, less air to come in from the external environment. A flutter valve is a one-way valve, so it doesn't let air in, but it lets air out. You certainly want to try and have that um, on any occlusive dressing. The easiest way to have that is to just not seal all four sides of the dressing down. There are commercial uh, occlusive dressings that come with a flutter valve already placed, um, but if you don't have that, just only type three of the sides. Um, there are other improvised dressings that we don't really um, use, such as a petroleum jelly or Vaseline soaked gauze. Uh, we try not to, we try to stay away from that. Um, we really want to do more like aluminum foil, plastic. Um, a lot of the packaging that our supplies come in, those make really good occlusive dressings. Here's the visual representation. Air is kind of flowing in and out where it's not supposed to be. Simple pneumothorax, you really don't have a huge change in uh, the respiratory patterns or cardiac physiology of the patient. Yeah, there's air getting in there, but it's not causing significant problems for them. Often due to blunt trauma that results in fractured ribs, this can deteriorate into a tension pneumo. You can develop complications, but really, this is more of a watch and wait type situation. We don't want to do any significant treatment on somebody that has a simple pneumothorax. For a tension pneumothorax, this is life-threatening because now all of a sudden you've got increased pressure up in the chest. You're decreasing not only one of the lungs on the affected side, but now you're pushing over into the mediastinum. So you're affecting all those blood vessels there, the heart itself. And then you actually can start affecting the other lungs, so you're not getting any sort of oxygenation at all. Here's kind of the overall representation of what's going on there. You can see a couple of different wound sites, one on the outside, one on the inside. More air flows in more rapidly. This needs to be treated immediately or your patient will die. ALS can do a needle chest decompression in order to relieve, relieve some of that pressure. It doesn't fix the problem. What fixes the problem is a chest tube. So they have to get to a hospital. We will keep going on specific chest injuries in the next video.